this is just the beginning. Welcome to One Big Thing, Reimagining Clean Energy Jobs. I'm Mike Allen, a co-founder of Axios, coming to you from Axios HQ in Arlington, Virginia. Our thanks to Climate Power for making these conversations possible as we unpack investments in clean, green energy jobs. Welcome to our audiences on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Axios.com. We'd love for you to follow along on Twitter at Axios, hashtag Axios events. I'll be joined by my colleagues, Margaret Talev, Axios Managing Editor for Politics, and our Editor-in-Chief, Nicholas Johnston. One fun thing, we'll be joined today by the current and a former Governor of Michigan. So great conversation ahead. Our first guest is a former Governor of Michigan and the Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm. She set records when she was elected and reelected Governor of Michigan, and then awards for managing in one of the nation's toughest economies, and she was the first female Attorney General of Michigan. Secretary Granholm, welcome to Axios. Thanks so much, Mike, glad to be on. Secretary, we're gonna plunge into investments in clean energy and jobs, but Axios always starts with the news, and our viewers have been paying attention to the hack of our nation's biggest pipeline. Secretary, looking down the road, what have we learned from this or what should our viewers be paying attention as they think about future risks, future opportunities? Yeah, I would say certainly the business community, they know this well, but these hacks are not going to stop. They, we, because everything is now with smart technology and is using the cloud, we are vulnerable everywhere. And so every private sector entity, whether you're an energy business or not, has to be thinking about how you protect your system, your operation system. So that I think is a big lesson for the private sector. And it's a big lesson for government to think about you know, is there, uh, what should we be doing inside of the government itself to prevent uh, attacks and hacks on us, whether it's um, the solar winds hack, which of course, um, you know, had very broad ramifications or, or what happened with the pipeline this past week. And Secretary, one more on this. If I'm watching this event on my phone in a gas line, what would you say to me? Yeah, this, particular pipeline was in an area of the country that doesn't have access to the deep water ports that we might be able to use shipping to be able to circumvent reliance on a pipeline. And so it's a question for, for us on a broader scale, but for people who are in gas lines right now, you should know that because the pipeline is open, the gas will be coming. And so within the next, if you're not seeing it, if you're in a rural area, it might take a day longer, but it is going to be opened up. You will have access to gasoline. We're asking people not to hoard. If you are okay with the amount that's in your tank, please wait because the bottom line is it's gonna open up and it will be fine, but it's gonna just take a couple of days for the, for the oil, the gas to get through the system. So Secretary Granholm, turning to the topic at hand, clean energy jobs and those investments. And this is something we've heard President Biden uh, talk about uh, from day one when we, he was president elect Biden. And something over the years, Secretary, that you and I have talked about is economic patriotism. Tell us what you mean by that. What I mean is that we should be building the means for our own economic and energy security here at home. There has been Historically, this big bowing to the altar of low cost and you know globalism and free trade and all of that's great, but what it has meant for us um, is that not all of it is great. We get the benefit of low cost products, but then we lose out on the jobs. And so the question is, for key industries, for key products, should we be considering making ourselves energy independent and nationally secure by building those supply chains here at home. We should be saying, if we are going to, for example, build the means to our electric vehicle future, we should be building the batteries to that here at home. We shouldn't be relying on countries that use child labor to extricate cobalt for the battery. So the bottom line is, if we care about our country, we should be building the means 
for our national security, our economic security, and our energy security right here at home. So Secretary, you talk about clean energy jobs as one way of controlling our own destiny. Correct, correct. And we, we want to be able to make sure that we can rely upon ourselves to be energy independent and to be nationally secure. And so one of the reasons that the president has put in the American Jobs Plan, for example, is to stand up these semiconductor fabrication facilities is so that we don't have to rely upon countries in Asia to be able to do that. There's a chokehold now. We've had to stop some lines of for vehicle production, for other production. Let's build it at home. Same thing with the critical minerals that would go into building the battery supply chain. We should be building that responsibly, mining responsibly here at home and putting our people to work. We shouldn't be buying wind turbines from, from Denmark. We should be building them here and stamping them made in America. And by the way, we could be exporting them as well. So I think that we have given up on making stuff in America. And this is our moment to reverse that trend. Uh, Secretary Granholm in Michigan, where you were reelected as governor and were attorney general, some of the green and clean energy themes were basically a bad word. And you found a way to navigate that. How is Michigan adapting and what can the rest of us learn from the Michigan experience? It's, this is a really great question, Mike, because of course, Michigan's history, our DNA has been in building a product that was reliant, for example, on fossil fuels, the internal combustion engine for the vehicle, Michigan, of course, being the auto capital of America. And when, when um, more efficient, fuel efficient vehicles came into the market and our uh, domestic auto industry was challenged, we had to look at that. And then when the recession happened and the auto industry essentially went bankrupt, we had to look again, what is it that we need to keep this backbone of our manufacturing industry in America strong? Well, we need to diversify and we need to diversify into areas where we know um, the, as we say in Michigan, where we know the puck is moving, um, the puck <laughs> is headed, we got to skate to that area. And in this case, it meant building the electric vehicle and means building the guts to that electric vehicle. So now the auto industry is off of its knees. It's building the electric vehicle. They've committed to, many of them have committed to all electric fleets. And by the way, Michigan makes one third of all North American battery production is in our state because we made policy choices to to double down on clean energy. So, and, and you know, people want their energy clean and they wanna be able to benefit from the jobs. And we wanna make sure that the products that get us there are built in the US. And that really was the pitch that I made in Michigan. And really it's the pitch I wanna make across the country. And it's more importantly, the pitch that the president is making across the country. Now, Secretary, as part of that pitch, you've been branded as part of the jobs cabinet. You were out the other day at Howard University. And I know that a point that's very important to you is people who have been left behind. Completely, I feel, and the president does too, because part of his commitment to investments in this clean energy sector means that 40% of the investments, whether it's from the American Jobs Plan or elsewhere, should go to communities that have been left behind. Now, these might be communities that have lived in the front lines of power plants and whose children cannot breathe because they have asthma, it's breathing in particulate matter from pollution, or it might be communities that the market has left behind because the whole globe is moving to clean energy and the fossil fuel communities who have workers in there through no fault of their own, who have the rug pulled out from under them. We want to make sure that those communities are seen, that we don't leave communities behind in this country. And that's why this jobs push in areas that need it most is so critical rural areas and urban areas for people who really need this. And the good thing about the clean energy arena is it's all kinds of jobs for all kinds of people in all pockets of America. So this is the, the big opportunity. It's a $23 trillion global market seeking products that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. $23 trillion. We should be staking our claim to some of that in America, building it for us and then exporting it for others. Secretary Granholm, a question from the Axios audience for you. If I'm thinking about clean energy, green jobs, and I'm a city, a county, a state, what should I be thinking? 
Um, you should be thinking about supply and demand. You want to make, make sure that you have the demand pull of policy that says that you are going to commit to getting a certain percentage of your energy from clean sources. And then you want to be able to supply that demand with creating policies for industrial clusters, perhaps in your state that manufacture the products to get there, looking at what your policies are for enhancing the development of solar, of wind, if you're in on one of the coasts, maybe offshore wind, but it's also an opportunity to be able to install technologies related to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the Department of Energy is the solutions department. We hope that if the American Jobs Project is passed, uh, plan is passed, that we will be able to install technology, putting people to work doing that, that will that, uh, on power plants that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Those are jobs that are really great too. Place-based strategies to be able to take advantage of a, the comparative advantage of communities is really what I think those leaders um, are and ought to be thinking about. And Secretary Granholm, another question from the Axios audience is about digital infrastructure or the digital component to clean energy jobs. Well, clearly we have so much in the way of smart technology, the internet of things, making sure that objects actually respond to, to uh, both communications as well as behaviors of individuals. Um, you know, that um, technology aspect of things is one of the reasons why I was at Howard University, because we wanna create a pipeline of students and of intellectual talent for science, technology, engineering, and math. The Department of Energy has 17 national laboratories. We are working on artificial intelligence. We're working on quantum computing. We're working on all the next generation of technologies that make energy smart. At the same time, and I'll finish where we started on this, as we make, techno as we make products smart, we also have to make them safe. And so both the cyber concerns, as well as making sure these these technologies are efficient and continue to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Both sides of that equation are things that the Department of Energy is all in on, leaning in on to make sure the country is both safe and has no CO2 emissions by 2050. Senator Granholm, Taylor's telling me, Mike, please wrap. So a quick penultimate question I'm gonna sneak in here is what are you bullish on when it comes to clean energy, green jobs? Oh, I'm so super bullish on the technologies that will get us to the goal of, get, of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. For example, carbon capture, use and sequestration, um, green hydrogen, blue hydrogen. I love geothermal, that's super exciting. <laughs> Small hydropower, advanced nuclear, uh, offshore wind, the next generation of both solar and wind technologies, material science, buildings, district heating. There's so much happening in the clean energy space that creates jobs. I am bullish on all of it. And I'm just hopeful that we are able to deploy, deploy, deploy. Secretary Granholm, your energy for energy is contagious. Well, we always finish with one fun thing. So as we say goodbye, you've always been a great tweeter. You've kept it up as Secretary Granholm. And the other day I saw that you have a new member of the family. Oh, I do. I do. My first grandchild was born a couple of weeks ago. Dylan Azul is his first and second name. And I'm just over the moon in love with this little guy. Secretary Granholm, congratulations to the family and thank you for joining Axios. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you, Secretary Granholm, and thank you to Climate Power for making these conversations possible. And now, a quick video from Climate Power. Calling all builders. Your country is calling you. Tackling climate change is the job of our lifetime. It's time to build back better. Let's get to work. Before Q cells was in Dalton, it was more just carpet mills. Q cells has been like the first around here that focuses on clean energy for millennials. Not a lot of us want to be jumping around job to job trying to figure out what we want to do. But in clean energy, we see a sense of job security and longevity, something that we're going to be able to do for a long time. 
it's important for Congress to invest in clean energy infrastructure because it sends a positive message to smaller communities like Dalton. It'll provide jobs for those that are struggling to meet their financial needs. We recover from COVID by putting millions of people back to work in clean energy jobs. Thank you for that message from our partner, Climate Power. I'm Nicholas Johnston, the editor-in-chief of Axios. I'm here with Senator Ron Wyden, chairman of the Finance Committee from Oregon. Senator, uh, hello, how are you? Thanks for joining us virtually today. Nick, thanks for having me on. So I'd love to start really big picture uh, and then sort of narrow down into policy uh, specifics on, on the importance of uh, clean energy jobs. Can you just give me philosophically, why do you think that's such an important thing to focus on as America comes out of the pandemic and we start to reopen again? I, th I think it's the future. If you look, for example, at, at my state, so much of the innovation is tied to the fact that my constituents feel so strongly about climate change and particularly reducing carbon. Just think about the events in my home state in the last year. We had staggering fires last uh, uh, fall. I mean, just breathtaking. I would go to communities that had literally been turned into dust. And then a few months ago, um, we had record breaking storms and I was in my basement without power and, uh, and lights. And so my constituents very much understand that this is not your grandfather's climate. Uh, it's something very different and much more challenging and something that's gotta be addressed. So let's talk about how you address it. You played a role in the drafting of the American Jobs Plan. Uh, how did clean energy jobs fit into that? What was the role you played? What was the response you got from the administration on these kinds of ideas? The president campaigned on, on this, and he recognized that uh, early on in March, there was a down payment. And essentially what I'm prepared uh, to do now as chairman of the finance uh, committee is really make a bold transformation with respect uh, to the tax code. There are more than 40 separate tax breaks on energy. And when you add it all up, it is an outdated, crazy quilt that keeps us from having the certainty and predictability that the country needs in order to really tackle the climate challenge and produce more clean energy jobs. So basically what I do is I take that tax code, that outdated um, mess, frankly, and I put it in the dustbin and I replace it with one that involves incentives for clean energy, a provision that involves incentives for clean transportation and energy efficiency. So what is now outdated, more than 40 separate tax provisions becomes three. And the message, Nick, I can sum up in one sentence. I am putting in place a market-oriented approach that focuses on competition and innovation with one bottom line objective, and that's reducing carbon in America. Right, so we're at the start of a journey here on legislation. You've been in Congress a long time, so you know how it works. What's the feedback you're getting? How do you see these proposals evolving as we start getting closer to real legislative language and want it to actually become law? Well, for, first of all, what I have is real legislative language. There are 31 United States senators sponsoring this bill. And the ranking Republican on our committee, Senator Mike Crapo of Idaho, who I've worked together often, we authored a, a landmark uh, provision in terms of of forestry, putting a new focus on fire prevention. So we've worked together very often. And Senator Crapo has a proposal that in many respects is quite similar to mine. And our legislation is backed by environmental groups. It's backed by labor unions. It's backed by Edison Electric. And I will tell you that I believe when uh, people evaluate Senator Crapo's proposal, which is also 
tech neutral, based on competitive forces in the marketplace, I think they're going to find much to be attracted uh, to what uh, Senator Crapo is talking about. And he and I have been talking about the comparisons between my proposal and his uh, on a number of occasions. Right. I mean, you mentioned you had 31 senators. You're going to need a handful more to get it through the Senate. Do you think there are other Republicans in addition to Senator Crapo who are willing to work with this? Is this a spot where there might be bipartisan agreement as we talk about whether this future jobs plan will have Republicans on board? I'm going to do everything I can, Nick, to do that. I have a long history of working uh, in a bipartisan uh, way. Sometimes I get criticized for being too uh, bipartisan. That's what I think is promising about Senator Crapo's recent uh, comments on this issue. We had a hearing, and uh, given the fact that he's a widely respected conservative Republican, I think the fact that he's the ranking uh, Republican on the Finance uh, Committee gives him a lot of sway on these issues, and I'm very encouraged by his remarks. Yeah, so you have a sense that uh, as this becomes real, bipartisanship is actually a, a possibility that on these kinds of topics, you might get Republicans to join you and that some of the uh, the lack of bipartisanship that was in the earlier stimulus measure might be overcome when we get down to these provisions. And, and Nick, part of this is also semantics. You know, what we've really um, said is that Republicans have been critical of the system of subsidies um, in the past. You know, a lot of these tax breaks sometimes have a shelf life barely longer than the shelf life of a carton of eggs because their tax extenders, they're in place for a few months and something else, you know, comes along. And I think that's why we picked up so much interest and support among. Uh, folks in the uh, electric uh, industry is that they find that this a uh, crazy quilt of tax provisions that can be very short term don't give the predictability and certainty that's needed. And by the way, I think it is fair to say the ball game with respect to rapid progress on climate change and meeting the president's targets and the like, you've really got to move ahead quickly on uh, progress with respect to the electric uh, industry, having uh, the Edison Electric uh, uh, Organization with us, with the NRDC and the Sierra Club and the Environmental right. Defense Fund, we've got a juggernaut uh, moving ahead. So simplicity and permanence for these provisions seems to be the secret sauce to getting them through, you think? And, and, and real competition in the marketplace. In other words, you know, you're hearing from a Democrat who's honored to be the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, who's saying that the present system doesn't work very well. And in a sense, it wasn't even particularly bold or innovative going back to 2009. The idea was just, well, let's offer a bunch more tax breaks and then we'll come back and see where we are. I think we've now seen that that hasn't created the the path for innovation. And I'm talking about free market competition built around one clear bottom line, which is reducing carbon. That's something that I think now brings Americans together. Awesome. Thank you very much, Senator Wyden. I appreciate you taking the time for Axios today. Nick, thanks a lot. A lot of fun. And now we'll have another word from our partner. Calling all builders. All welders and roofers, engineers and electricians, calling all brick masons and boilermakers, steel workers and steam fitters. Your country is calling you to rebuild America, to create a cleaner, safer, more prosperous future for all. Tackling climate change, this is the job of our lifetime. It's time to build back better. Let's get to work. This was a business that I bought after I'd lost everything in the recession of 1990. And we've built it substantially over the last 30 years. We are one of the largest companies in the nation that supplied solar panel tags and decals. There's a real opportunity for people who are unemployed right now for me to hire them in a good paying job. It's time to start building in America again. 
If we invest in clean energy, I can put people to work right now. Hello, I'm Margaret Tal of Managing Editor for Politics here at Axios, and our final guest is Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Hello, Governor Whitmer. Hi, Margaret. Well, thanks so much for making the time. As you know, we're talking about clean energy jobs today, and you've been making some news on that front. Uh, last fall, of course, you issued an executive order to make Michigan carbon neutral by 2050. This is one of the most aggressive plans like this in the country. Then last month around Earth Day, you set another really interesting target. Uh, this is for state-owned facilities to be on 100% renewable energy by 2025. That's you know just a few years from now. And then finally this week, you said that you will go after the profits of Enbridge, a Canadian energy company, if it uh, continues to defy your order to stop operating one of its lines that runs through Michigan. So these are three like huge issues, three big things. How did you decide on these approaches and how do you think about how to achieve them without hurting Michigan's economy? Well, on day one, I um, we moved forward and joined the Paris Climate Accords. We wanted to make Michigan a leader where our nation had taken a step backwards. I thought it was important that the state show that this is something that we are committed to. We've been uh, announcing lots of uh, investment in Michigan through the big three, 11,000 jobs, uh, which are manufacturing mobility uh, solutions of the future. So electric vehicles, we're putting people to work. This is good for our economy. It's good for our climate change goals. And it's good for individuals seeking great jobs. And then protecting the Great Lakes. You know, we are defined by the Great Lakes in Michigan. The manufacturing came to Michigan because of the water. We've got to protect this water. And this pipeline going through the Straits of Mackinac is a ticking time bomb. And so all of these things are absolutely related, but we can be great stewards of our environment and keep people in good paying jobs all at the same time. It's not uh, one or the other. The state's connections to the auto industry run so deep and US automakers, all of them are, are now talking and thinking about fuel efficiency, electric cars, but are you disappointed that they really had to play catch up to some of these tech startups in terms of getting to market? Well, I, I know that um, when you're talking about you know monolithic organizations, it takes a little while to get them turned, right? Um, I There's some phenomenal things that are happening in our big three. And as they go, they pull a lot of other businesses with them and they make their um, investments accordingly. And that's why I think it's so important that we're ready, that we build up the infrastructure to support electric vehicles, that we work very uh, closely with our neighboring states and of course the federal government as we stake out aggressive agenda in this space to support the, these uh, mobility solutions of the future. So I think it's an exciting time. I'm really glad to see leadership coming out of these bigger auto companies. Um, and, and I know that our ability to meet these aggressive goals is absolutely dependent on us working together to get there. Uh, how involved are the big automakers in your discussions as you, uh, you know, approach different policy approaches or different stances? And uh, <laughs> have you expressed your views to them on what you think about building electric vehicles in Mexico rather than in Michigan? Oh, there, there's no uncertainty about where we <laughs> stand on that one. I want to. This is the auto capital of the world. We have been for a long time. We still are. We've got the talent. Um, we we just, I think, need to focus on bringing manufacturing home and keeping it home. We saw that throughout COVID, frankly, when we are reliant on the manufacture of everything from swabs to N95 masks uh, coming out of other countries that are completely shut down. It undermines our homeland security and our ability to take care of our people. And that's precisely why I think a renewed investment and attraction to manufacturing in the United States is so crucial on so many fronts. But um, the auto companies are important partners of us in getting to our goals and keeping people in good paying jobs and uh, transitioning toward the future. And so they are partners. Doesn't mean we agree on every every little aspect, but um, we're gonna continue to work with them and make sure that they make the investments right here at home. Um, it's been reported President Biden's gonna visit Michigan next week, May 18th. This is ahead of the launch of Ford's new plant in Dearborn, some of the electric uh, vehicle work they're doing. Are you going to join him on that visit? And what do you need from his administration right now on these policies? 
I hope to join him. I think that they're doing a fantastic job. I mean, everything from their COVID response to prioritizing investment here at home, whether it's an in infrastructure, getting people back to work, or the care economy. I mean, these are the things that really matter to people. And I'm excited about the work that they're doing. They've been a great partner to us and my administration and to the state of Michigan. And so an opportunity to highlight these uh, investments that are happening right here um, to to move people in a in a conscious way, um, I think is is really exciting. And so I'm I'm excited to welcome the president back to Michigan. Will you talk to him about Enbridge when he's there, or have you already? What do you need from the White House from the Biden administration on the pipeline, and, and what do you think they could deliver for you? Well, I have talked with um, the administration and the president directly actually about this subject as well as others. He came to Michigan um, in February, I think it was, to uh, come to Pfizer. We are running uh, so many vaccines come right out of Michigan, protecting people, saving lives. And so to highlight that here in manufacturing in Michigan was a great opportunity. And we did chat about it because it's important that states retain the ability to determine the location of these pipelines. That is clear in federal law, even though Enbridge has taken us to federal court uh, saying that we don't have jurisdiction when in fact we do. And that's why 18 other states have joined us on our side of the lawsuit. We retain that ability and it is crucial. This pipeline is a ticking time bomb and that's why we are, we're fighting to protect the Great Lakes and, and to make sure that um, this, you know, the, the, the you know, catastrophic event of a, a anchor tearing that line and polluting the Great Lakes and undermining drinking water and tourism and um, for people all across this region uh, is we got to protect it and that's what we're going to continue to do and I'm hopeful the administration will will join us. Uh, governor, you were elected governor in 2018. You're up for re-election next year. It's widely assumed you'll run for re-election, but could you end the mystery here for uh, your fans and watchers who care about uh, clean energy issues? You are running, right? I have a lot of important issues on the agenda that are gonna take a lot longer than just another year. And so I would anticipate that announcement coming, but I'm not making it today. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, I'm going to throw one more at you before uh, we leave then. Um, you're a woman in politics. You uh, you know that there are differences still today in terms of how women politicians are treated from men politicians in different circumstances. I'm wondering, watching what went down with Liz Cheney this week, do you believe that she would have been treated differently by the Republican Party if she were a man? And is she someone, even though she's a conservative, that you believe that you can work with on clean energy and economic development issues? Well, you know what, I these issues transcend political party and we have to figure out how to work together. We have to figure out how to talk to one another. I've been engaging with people across the state and what I'm calling is fixing the damn road ahead. I used to be just fix the damn roads, but we're doing that. But I wanna talk about how do we find common ground? There's no question that women in this workplace and in many workplaces are treated differently. I don't think that that's changed a great deal. We're certainly seeing more women lean in and take on leadership positions. And I think that that's a, a great thing. I know you talked to former Governor Jennifer Granholm, who's Secretary Granholm now. Um, she broke a glass ceiling here in Michigan and I've been a beneficiary of that, but it still is a, a different treatment. I can't speak to how Liz Cheney was um, treated within that caucus. I can just tell you that I um, applaud her speaking truth to power. And um, even if she pays a personal price for doing what she thinks the right thing is, and I think that's what leadership is all about. Governor Whitmer, answering many questions on clean energy, artfully dodging, but almost announcing <laughs> Uh, her re-election bid in 2022. And uh, for all those reasons, we thank you very much for sharing some time with us today. Thank you so much for joining Axios. We hope you'll come back, talk to us again soon. Thank you, I look forward to it. Thanks for joining us this afternoon for another virtual conversation that's hopefully made everyone smarter, faster. And thanks to our sponsor, Climate Power, for making this event possible. For more information or to sign up for Axios AM, please visit us at axios.com slash newsletters or on the Axios app. Thanks again for joining us today.